Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, New Covenant. It's so good to see you all this morning. My name is Quintella, and we've just come here just, first of all, to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you. I'm so thankful that the Lord has, has kept you all and gave you traveling mercies to get here. He kept you all week long until this very moment. So we just want to praise him. We thank him for his goodness. And now we just like to do a couple of praise and worship songs. And we ask that you stand and join in with us. If you don't know the songs, they're real easy. You can learn them. Stand up on your feet. Let's give God some praise today. Amen. Amen. you know that no one else can receive the glory. It all belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can sing this with a simple call and response. Very easy. Like I said, if you don't know, we'll teach you. Okay? All right. This part goes like this. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. No one else can receive the praise. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. 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 No one else can receive the praise.
the King of Glory. And we just praise Him for His sacrifice, for His keeping power. We thank you, God. We bless your name today, Jesus. And we know that because you and through you, all things are possible. We love you, God.
in this world at this moment, at this time, you are still on the throne. And because it didn't take you by surprise, we're so thankful, we're so grateful. We know that because of you, Father, we are here today. You have a word for us. You have something you want us to understand that we just don't quite understand. But you also you want to love on us because you're such a loving God. You know we need it. We need to have peace right now. But we need your peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding is what we need today because this world is so upside down. They want us to believe that right is wrong and yes is no. But we thank you that you are our God. You set all things into motion. And because of your grace and your mercy, we're able to stand here today and in the midst of whatever it is, say thank you, Lord.
Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. At a seminar held recently on how to live in a loving relationship with your spouse, something wonderful happened. A group of women were asked, when was the last time they told their husband or their spouse that they loved them? Some women said, today. Others said, yesterday. Others said, I don't remember. <laughs> then they were told to take their cell phones out and text the following message to their spouse. I love you, babe. Then they were asked to exchange phones and read the responding messages from their spouse. I'm going to give you three. One of them said, who is this? <laughs> Another one said, what do you want now? <laughs> Another one said, I love you too. If you could send in I love you message text to God, how would he respond to you? Would he ask, who is this? <laughs> would he ask, what do you want now? Or would he say, I love you too? Well, all who have been chosen by the love of God will never, ever have to worry about God ever asking, who is this, or him saying, what do you want now? 
thank God that he is not like us. He doesn't love us like we love. God has a different kind of love. He loves us with what the Bible calls an everlasting love. And I'm so glad about that because there are times when when people stop loving and they stop liking and then they just stop talking. And uh, that's a dangerous place to get. But God never, ever stops listening to those he's chosen to be his children. He's always open, he's always available, and he always invites us to come. God's love is both a verb and a noun in the Old Testament And love is who he is, and love is how he acts. An act of love was was, was seen when he demonstrated his love for us in that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and he acted on behalf of the love of God. His love acted when he chose us, When he chose us before the foundation of the world, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1. And then also, the love was shown when the blood of Christ was shed for us so that we could be cleansed, so that we could be holy, so that we could be righteous, so that we could become children of God. The love of God has been poured out out into our hearts, it says in Romans 5, 5, through the Holy Spirit whom God gave to us. And... The proof that he gave himself for us is in the love that he placed into all of our hearts so that we could love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, as children of God's love, here's how we ought to act. 1 John 3 says, let us not love in words or tongue, but with actions. So let me ask you, how have you been loving this week? Have your actions been loving Or have your actions been impatient, without compassion, without mercy, without grace? The Bible says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And that's a good question. The first time that love is used, as I said before, it's in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham was asked by God to offer his only son whom he loved as an offering, as a sacrifice to God on the mountain where God told him to offer him. It's a picture, I said, of what God did for us when he gave us his only begotten son whom he loved. God's love also chose Abraham. That's who we're going to be looking at today along with his nephew Lot. He was called a friend of God. And the Bible says this about those who are friends. It says, a friend sticks closer than a brother. Then it says, a friend loves at all times. So if we are children of God's love and recipients of God's love and God's love is in our hearts, how are we loving? Are we loving at all times, or are we uh, a sometime me kind of lover? Love you when I'm getting what I want, and when I don't, I don't love you. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. But I, I have chosen to call you my friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have also made known to you. This is what God does with his friends. He makes things known to us. Now, a lot of people say, well, I had a dream. Is God talking to me in a dream? I don't know how God speaks to you. But here's how God speaks to me. He speaks to me from his word. When I'm reading his word, God will speak to me from a verse of scripture that I read from his word then God will also lead me by his spirit to, 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 re, to, to reveal something to me that I hadn't seen before. Or, and, and it's always in my prayer life and in my studying the scripture that God reveals himself. The Bible says God revealed himself to us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So anything that the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus said it. He said, well, wait a minute. He didn't start talking until... The New Testament, you know, in the red letters, um, Jesus is the word of God. 
So if he is the word of God that became flesh, did he just start speaking when he was uh, in the New Testament and the red letters? No, uh, the, the Bible was, was, was made through the word of God and Jesus is the word of God and he became flesh and dwelt among us. So every, every, every just because in, in, in Genesis you don't see any red lettering doesn't mean God didn't speak it. He spoke it. And you can believe every word, every jot and tittle, everything, because God cannot lie. And so God's word is, 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 is made known to, to Abraham because God is going to do something. And let me set this up, at, up, up front because, see, as soon as I say two words, some of you are going to get all tight and you're going to just, you're going to probably just want to close me off, shut me down, or some of you, if you, if you have enough boldness, you may even walk out. So let me just stop you right now. Okay, I just want to set this up. Because as soon as you hear two words, you automatically think, I'm going to preach about those two words. And I'm not going to preach about those two words. The message today is about God's grace, God's loving kindness, and God's mercy and salvation. It's in the verses of Scripture that we're going to see today. But see, as soon as I say these two words, you're going to go off the reservation. This, what I'm going to teach you today has nothing to do with your sexuality. So now, I've said it. <laughs> God made his plans known <laughs> to Abraham in Genesis 18 because <laughs> of his desire to rescue Lot. And I believe that Abe's relationship with God rubbed off on his nephew Lot because when Lot was younger, Abraham was really a, a surrogate father to him. And so I believe that's why he took Lot along, along with him because he was kind of like a son. But there is something that's happening between Abraham and Lot, and uh, we're going to see that. But, uh, but I believe that Abraham, because he, he was a righteous man, he was a friend of God, and he was walking in the ways of God, and he gave his life to God. He believed in, 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 in by faith, and God reckoned to him as righteousness. And so uh, I believe that because of that, and because Lot was aware of all of that, that some of that rubbed off on Lot, and Lot is really, uh, and, and the, the Bible backs it up, by the way. But, uh, but Lot and, and Abraham, uh, they had some trouble. Uh, well, they had a little had to split, but, uh, but before all that, uh, Lot was in trouble because he had asked for God's loving kindness, and, uh, and not because, but, be, but he, he was in trouble, and because he knew about God's loving kindness from uh, his uncle, uh, he called on God's loving kindness. He also called on God's grace, and he asked for God to save him out of the situation that he found himself in. Before that happens, Lot and Abe will have to separate because of strife between their herdsmen and, and, and their lot, the, the herdsmen of their livestock. Uh, and, and so Abraham, to avoid strife, he tells Lot, look, Lot, I, I just want you to look at all the land before us, and whatever you choose, that's fine. I'll choose whatever's left. So he gave uh, Lot first choice of everything. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10 is where we start. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. I told y'all not to go there. They went there, Sam. I'm not talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sexuality is not even an issue today. It's about God's loving kindness. Then go back. Let me go back. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zor. So apparently it was a very beautiful place. And so Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. 
Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom, but he didn't go into Sodom. He was kind of like a city away from Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were exceedingly and uh, were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the, from the place where you are. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and its breadth, and I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And so Abraham picked out his part, Lot picked out his part. Now, in the story of Sodom, I was reading it, and, 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 and I read it, and I, I, I saw three words pop up. Favor, loving kindness, and salvation. And I thought, so, the, so this whole story in Sodom and Gomorrah, a lot of people are looking at the wrong thing. They ought to be looking at a person who is trapped in a situation of his own choosing, and he is so settled into this place that he can't get out because now he's dug in and he's made some roots in this place. His family likes the place. And so, you know, mama said, no, I don't want to leave. I got some friends, you know, and my girlfriends and everything. And, you know, I, I like it here. It's beautiful. And why do we have to leave? Oh, yeah, we got a few strange people, but we don't have to leave. Let's just stay here. And so I believe that that's why Lot still hung around. But loving kindness, God's loving kindness, God's grace and salvation are words that are going to pop up. So Lot chose to settle near Sodom. And then after, after a while, he's, he sees the beauty of Sodom. And, and, but later, Lot, he decides to sit in Sodom. First, he was on the outskirts. Now he's sitting in Sodom, and he chose to do this. Choices have consequences. Some choices are blessings. Other, other choices are burdens. Not only burdens for you, but burdens for other people. It's ca it cascades. It, it's just because you sin and you think, well, I sin, and I didn't hurt anybody in my sinning, wrong you will hurt someone else by your choice because con choices have consequences. And so we'll see that in, in, in Lot's life. And, 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 and Lot's consequences, or whether, rather his choices, affected his, his uncle Abraham because Lot lost all of his possessions when several kings decided to come and invade Sodom and Gomorrah. In doing so, they took the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah hostage. They took all of their possessions, and they took all of the people that were in Sodom as prisoners, and they made them their slaves. And so in that bunch was Lot. And now Abraham gets word about what has happened to Lot, and so Abraham, what he does is, he decides to go down to, Sod to, to go uh, where Lot is, and he then, he and his men defeat all of the kings that had taken Sodom's king and Gomorrah's kings and Lot, um, and, and Lot captive, and he delivers them. And he sets them all free and, and releases them and gives them all of their possessions. And, and so the, the, the king of, of, of Sodom wanted to offer uh, something to Abraham. And Abraham said, I don't want nothing from you. And, and so uh, if you would read that story. And, and so, uh, so but, but the thing about the story is after Lot gets all of his possessions back, 
rather than going back with his uncle, he decides to go back to Sodom. He couldn't get enough. He had, probably had a nice house because he was rich. So he went back with his herdsmen and livestock, went back, and now he's back in Sodom. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 16, this explains to me and to you why God felt so um, awful about Sodom, uh, well, why he was so angry with Sodom and, and why he did what he did to Sodom. In, in, in Ezekiel 16, God said Samaria was just as evil as her sister Sodom. And he said Sodom was a rich city, but Sodom, even though they were rich, you know what happened? They refused to help the poor people. They just abused the poor people. And so one little sin began to move into other sins. So if you don't help the poor, that's why Jesus said in the New Testament, he says, when you desire, you can help the poor if you will. He said, the poor will be with you always, but when you desire, you can do them good. So that's why as a church family, as a church body, we have you know, a benevolence committee because there's sometimes people fall into situations and, and they need some help. And so uh, some churches, they do it differently. And when everybody runs their house the way they want to run it. Uh, we don't, uh, in some, I was at some church and they would bring the names of people who needed money to the meeting of the church membership. And they'll say, so-and-so and so-and-so needs X amount of money to pay their rent. Well, do they, everybody need to know that? Why would they need to know that? Now, I think intelligent people that in a benevolence committee like we have, none of you know who needs anything, only the benevolence committee. I don't know that, what decision they've made. I, I don't get involved with that. So don't call me up and say, Pastor, can you help me get some money from the Benevolence Committee? We have a system. You fill out the paperwork, and when you fill out the paperwork, then the committee then decides whether or not you get money. But you have to be a member of the church, or you have to be a giver in our church. Uh, just because, you know, you visited us one Sunday doesn't mean that you can get some money. You have to be frequently coming here, and you have to have given something while you came here because we just don't give out God's resources to anyone. We have to be good stewards of God's money. That's, that, that's, a, that, that's a side note. But let me get back here because when you don't have regard for the poor, then you won't have regard for anything because that's what happened in, with Sodom. They got a little money, and then they got funny because they got a little money. <laughs> and people do act funny, don't they? When they get a little something, something. So before Sodom's destruction, God made known his plans to his friend Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from his tent door to, the, uh, to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. And he said, my Lord. He knew exactly who was standing there with the other two. If now I have found favor in your sight, that's the same word that uh, uh, Lot's going to use, Please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. He's so excited and understandably so. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham does that. So Abraham hurried into the tent of Sarah and said, quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and then make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf, and he gave it to the servant 
and then he, and he hurried uh, to prepare it, just as Abraham had asked him. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. So Abraham goes and prepares food. Verse 16. Then the men arose, men, the men rose from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave, and I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And of course, God doesn't do that. So Abraham starts talking to God, and he says, Well, Lord, Lord come near. And he, and he said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And God says, No, I won't do that. Far be it from you, Lord, to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. God doesn't do that. He does not treat the wicked the same as the righteous. Abraham believed that there were some righteous people in Sodom because of Lot. He assumed that Lot must have been doing something with his life, must have been sharing the faith that he had with Abraham. I believe and so I believe that Abraham believed that because Lot was there, certainly he must have been sharing his faith, but he didn't know that Lot wasn't doing a thing. So he intercedes on, on the basis of God's loving kindness, compassion, mercy, grace, and justice. He asked God to spare the wicked if there were 50. And then he said, well, God, what about 45? God says, okay. I will spare them if they're 45. And then Abraham said, well, what about 40? God says, okay, if they're 40, I will spare. He said, well, what about 30? He said, if they're 30, I'll spare them. He said, well, let me ask you, well, what about 20? And he said, okay, I'll spare the city if they're 20. He said, let me ask you one final time. This is God, what about if they're 10 righteous? Will you spare the city? He says, okay, Abraham. I will spare the city. Far be it from you, Abraham says, shall not the judge of the earth deal justly? And God says to Abraham, okay, Abraham, I, I will spare them if they're just 10. Genesis chapter 18, verse 32. Then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry, and shall I speak only this once? Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten, Abraham. Can you see the patience of God? I mean, Abraham is interceding and he's trying, he's, he's more concerned about sinners than some of us are. He's concerned about God destroying some people and the righteous along with the wicked. And so, you know, we ought to be concerned about the same kinds of things. We ought to be concerned that, you know, wait a minute, there are a lot of wicked people in the world. People are shooting other people, I mean, for no apparent reason. And then they go cuckoo in the brain, and then, you know, they lose their mind, and they go out and start blowing people up. And, you know, and if they don't have a gun, they'll use a car. If they don't have a car, they'll find some way to kill somebody. There's a way, if, if people want to kill somebody else, they will do it. And, you know, I, I, I don't think a lot of people need to have some of these kinds of guns. 
you know, but you take them away, they, they, no, they're going to find something. And, 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 and when you take it out of the marketplace, then it's going to be even easier because, you know, they'll be able to pay some money to get whatever it is that they want. Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. This is for the adults in the room. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. I'm not going to stop in any place. I'm just going to read it. I don't need to explain it. Now, <laughs> the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Now, the fact that he was sitting at the gate in Sodom said this. You don't sit at the gate of a city unless you are a judge or wealthy with influence and you happen to hold some kind of political power. So the fact that Lot was sitting at the gate of the entrance meant that he was wealthy, he was a judge, Something was, what, 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 was, was, what was in Lot's last name, Lot judge, Lot wealthy, Lot uh, so wealthy that, you know, he has this particular p p position. Whatever it is, he's sitting at the gate. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He recognizes that God's in the place. And he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They, however, said, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Oh, wait a minute. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old. They didn't even have text messages back then, but they knew those guys were in Lot's house. <laughs> All the people from every quarter, and they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers. Brothers? Lot, these are your bros. Do not act wickedly. I mean, you know, if you're my brother, I'm going to be telling you about Jesus. Okay? So if he's, if he's calling them their bro his brother, then why don't they know about Jesus? I, I just, just a side note. I said I wasn't going to explain nothing, and I hear I'm explaining it. <laughs> now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with men. I don't know why he said this. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. I don't know why he said this. I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he is acting like a judge. So he must have been in a seat of some power. Now we will treat you worse than them. Oh, my goodness. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Keep out the devil. <laughs> <laughs> they... they they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? Now, they asked the question, but Lot doesn't give them the answer. They give Lot the answer. They say, A son-in-law and your sons 
and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now, when, when they came to Lot, there were three men. When they went in the house, there were two men, two angels. God, I believe, left the scene and left the rest of it up to the angels. But that Lot, the fact that Lot bowed down to God showed God that he had some reverence for God. I believe. Now, you can read it and believe whatever you want. So then Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get out of here! Get out of this place! For the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be joking. They didn't leave. They, wait, a, wait a minute. Lot? You're asking us to do this? Now, what does the Bible say about Lot? 2 Peter 2 says, Lot was a righteous man and a leader who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. Like Lot, we too are declared righteous because of the sacrifice of Christ. And as believers, we ought to be distressed by the lawlessness of of people we see in the world today. I mean, if, you're, if your soul doesn't ache, there's certain news stories I can't show my wife because when she sees it, she immediately starts weeping. When she sees how people are treating other people, she can't take it. I mean, she, she, I see her with a napkin and she starts, I, you know, I try to turn it off to, to house hunters. And I've seen more fights on house hunters, man, than I hate. I want a colonial. I want all brick. And then they start fighting against each other. I just want that. And my wife said, I don't want to hear that. I have to turn it off, and I just turn the whole thing off. <laughs> Are you distressed by the lawlessness that you see today? My heart aches for what I see going on in the world. Let me show you Genesis 19, verse 15. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Man, get out of there. So the men seized his hand. Come on. And the hand of his wife. Come on. <laughs> Mom was probably looking in the closet, dudes looking in his closet, and they, man, I got these nice clothes. I need mean, my some shoes, some sandals, man. I mean, I, I'm leaving all this. Wait a minute, we just put this new stove in here, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion, there's the word, the compassion of who? The Lord was upon him, upon whom? Upon Lot. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, escape for your life. Watch what he says next. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, oh, no, my lords. Now, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. That's grace. And you have magnified your loving kindness. That's hesed. That comes from God, which you have shown to me by saving my life. Favor, loving kindness, and salvation. This is what this is all about. What God is saying is if you are in a situation where you are surrounded with a lot of different things that just grieves your spirit, God is, say, God is saying, ask for my favor. 
Ask for my loving kindness, and I will save you out of that situation. Maybe you want a job, and, 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 and your heart is grieved because of how you are being mistreated. Call on God's favor. Ask for God's loving kindness. Ask him to save you out of that place. This is what God is wanting to say to us today. Nothing should be so horrible that you can't get God to bring you out. He can bring you out of any situation. You know, when we are tempted, we are tempted because of our own desires. Don't blame it on God because God doesn't tempt anyone. When anyone is tempted, it's because they have desired to be tempted. But he says, I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. It is not, is, is it not small that my life may be saved? He said to him, behold, watch what he says, behold, I grant you this request also. So he said, I've given you favor. I've given you loving kindness. And I'm going to save your life by giving you a place to go so that you can be saved. You and your family. This is in addition to what you've already asked for not to overthrow this town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was Zoar, or Zor. The, sound, the, the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife, from behind him, looked back. But the way she looked back, the verb tense means she looked back and she continued to look back continuously. She wasn't watching where she was going. She was too fascinated with what was behind her, thinking about, I believe, it's not in the text, so it's just my belief. I believe she's thinking about all the things, all the friends, the position, the nice house, everything she's leaving behind to go to some small city. You know, when women make their nests in their homes, they don't like to leave that thing. In fact, if dude is crazy and he's acting up, she ain't going nowhere. She changed the locks on the door and dude can't get in. Mama, most women don't leave their house after they made their nest. No, they ain't going nowhere. They kick you out. <laughs> So his wife became a pillar of salt. You know where that salt came from? It came from around the Dead Sea. And so many believe that she was this pillar, the statue of salt facing the Dead Sea. Now, isn't that an image? You dead and everything in front of you dead. And you can do nothing about it because you did. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about, when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of uh, out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived now 
Let me try to unpack a whole bunch of stuff here. There are a couple things that uh, I want to point out. Number one, when God provides a way of escape, don't hesitate. Pack your stuff and hit the road. When God delivers you, don't look back. Keep looking straight ahead. Because whatever is behind you, not going to do you any good. It's gonna, you're going to end up in a, in a place where you don't want to be. Now, it says that God remembered Abraham, which begs the question, does God forget? Well, how can an all-knowing, infinite God ever forget anything? He can't forget anything. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. I got issue with that. Doesn't the Bible say that God throws our sins into the sea of forgetfulness? No. That ain't in the Bible. Now, I'll tell you what's in the Bible. That isn't actually in the Bible. What's in the Bible is in Micah 7. It says, God will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. That's what it says. See, we, we add our little stuff in there. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So why does it say that God remembered? Well, God didn't forget, but what he was saying was he remembered what Abraham had asked of him. That's what it means. It didn't mean that he forgot anything. So whenever we see the phrase God remembered, it's followed by an action by God on behalf of his people. God remembered Abraham's words. So when God remembers sin, he punishes it. When God remembers his people, he blesses them with his steadfast love. That's what he did for Lot. He blessed him. He blessed Lot because of his steadfast love. Lot was blessed when God saved him by providing a way of escape. And God did, did it because of his favor and compassion and loving kindness. And uh, Abe remembered God wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. That's why he prayed the way he prayed. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because God didn't find ten righteous people in the city. He did find six, but two didn't believe. And Lot's wife died because, well, she looked back. So only three made it out alive, Lot and his two youngins. The verb tense means more than a glance, as I said, over the shoulder. She was continuously focusing on what she had left behind. Paul wrote in Philippians, forget those things that are behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. Hebrew says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. There's something that the, this guy named Isaac Dennison said, which I remember from a long time ago. It says, you cannot change the past, but you can run the present by worrying about the future. Jesus said, so don't worry about the future. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What do we keep looking back at? Past mistakes that we've made, heartaches that we've suffered, possessions we've lost, people who've died. I can identify with it. I've lost friends. I've lost people. I've lost possessions. I've made mistakes that have broken my heart. I mean, I can make a list and you'd be playing your little violin for me. And I'd be playing my little violin for you, too. So what is God saying? Well, if you've lost some good friends along the way, maybe some loved ones have departed to heaven to stay. You know that song? But thank God I didn't lose everything. Out of all the things that I lost in my life, I can tell you this. 
I have never lost God's steadfast love since I became a believer. And even before I became a believer, God never removed his love from me because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And his love for us was always there. The spirit of his love was always around everyone so that at the moment that they wanted to be saved, that love could save us. And his love is forever and steadfast. And so so whenever you decide to put your faith in Christ, God already loves you, and he can't love you any more than he does because his love is perfect. And because he loves me, nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. Neither angels, neither sin, neither me, nothing can separate me from the love of God. In the time of crisis, Friends were never there, but in my disappointment, in my season of pain, one thing never wavered, <laughs> one thing never changed. I never lost my hope. I never lost my joy. I never lost my faith, but most of all, I never lost my praise. <laughs> I can tell you this. Even when I got the word that my son, who had moved back to Baltimore from North Carolina, where he and his family lived, I got the call that he had died that night. My son Keith had a bad heart, and it was compounded with the fact that he was using drugs and he couldn't break that habit. I, I, I begged that boy, I, I, I said, don't go back to Baltimore because Baltimore is a black hole. You're going to get gobbled up in that place. I said, I, I left that place and I'm never going back. I had to go back a couple of times. My mom would live there. But after she moved, I never went back except for his funeral. And I had to deliv deliver the eulogy. Let me tell you something. Ain't nothing like doing a eulogy for you for your son, for your baby. And I was able to do it by the grace of God. So I understand loss. I understand the pain of the heartache. And, 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 and I, understand, I, I understand a lot of things about grief. Having, you know, seen my mom one night, she's fine. One day we're talking to her, she's laughing. Uh, the, the physical therapist tells, tells us, you know, hey, she's doing a great job. She's doing 90% of what we ask her to do. And so my mom says, get off the phone. I want to I I get my physical therapy. I said, mom, I mean, okay, you know. Gee, mom, you know. I hung up. And uh, the next day, that morning, when I went to uh, do my show, I got a call on my phone, and the lady said, uh, is this Bernie Miller? I said, yes, it is. She said, Mr. Miller, I'm calling and let you know your mom passed away last night. Now, it hit me, and I, you know, I, I called Madeline, told her, and I tried to walk through the tears, you know, and talk through the tears, rather. So I understand loss. I understand. It, it, hits, different pe it hits people differently, and, 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 and maybe it's, it hits you differently. But you know what? I know where my mom is. I know where my son is. Yeah, he did drugs, but I know he was born again. I know my mom was saved. I know where they are. I know I'm going to see him again. Do I, and I got a picture up in my study, but I don't look. She ain't here. I remember some of the times we had, yeah, I remember those things, but I don't go back and stay there. I'm in right now today. I'm looking forward to seeing them in the future. I'm not in a hurry, though, to see them in the future, you know. <laughs> I'm going to squeeze out as much life down here as I can. <laughs> I ain't wishing nothing on myself, you understand? Yeah. Yeah. Lot's life is a picture of God's grace loving kindness and salvation for those who compromise and conform to this world. People think they can lose their salvation. Lot didn't lose his. He just allowed his mind to be conformed by the world in which he lived. It was his choice. And when we make choices, choices have consequences. 
One thing that I can tell you this is that God provided a way of escape for Lot, and he'll provide a way of escape for you. No matter what you're going through today, when God delivers you, don't look back. People go around, they say, well, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I'm recovering, you know, and I'm recovering, I'm a recovering sinner. But thank God, I have been delivered, (laughs) and I have been set free by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so I don't have to remember all that stuff. When I introduce myself, I'm not a recovering anything. I am who I am in in the eyes of God. When Jesus taught about Lot, you know what he did? He talked about Lot and all the people that were living during that time and what they were all doing. And then he said he ended that whole little section in Luke, and he tells his disciples and those to whom he was speaking, he said, remember Lot's wife. And I thought, whoa. He talks about Lot and, and all that and what the people were doing, and then he said, remember Lot's wife. And I thought about that. She looked back. And what is God trying to tell us? Stop looking in the rearview mirror of life. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your face. We have been chosen since the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love, Ephesians says. So since we've been chosen by the love of God, then We are to be loving because that love of God is in us through the Holy Spirit. We've been chosen by the love of God to be loved and to be loving. So the first person that we ought to love is God. And then ourselves. And then our neighbors. If we can't love ourselves, how are you going to love your neighbor? Because the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So now, if you don't have any love for yourself, how can you love your neighbor? So if you have a problem loving other people, can I ask you something? Is the love of God in your heart? Do a gut check. I see stuff on TV and all the time, but I love those people. I love, I love all the people. Why? Because God so loved the world. He loved the people, all the different people, all the different kinds of people, all the different crazy people, all the different, you know, I mean, people, people. I mean, he loves them all. So if God loves all these people, we ought to be loving all these people. Amen? I mean, you know, you may have your, you know, I don't like their ways. Well, you know, God didn't like your ways either. There's some ways that he still doesn't like about you, and you're still doing them, and he still loves you. So who are you to point your finger at somebody else? You better take that light pole out of your eye before you try to to get a little little splinter out of somebody else's eye. Anyway, uh, I, I, I want you today to think about where you are with God. Are you loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Are you loving your neighbors as yourself? If you are, then things ought to be good around you, or at least better and livable around you. But if you're not showing love, grace, mercy, and compassion to people around you, how in the world are you going to exist? How will they know that God is in you if you don't just demonstrate God's love, compassion, and mercy, and most of all, forgiveness? We got someone to baptize today. Come on up here. Where, where, where are you? Who is? Wait. All right now. Now last week, last week in our youth, one of our youth gave their lives to Christ last week. Oh. What about that? And, 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 while, and, and while, while the one is coming, let me explain what happened. Last week, uh, all the youth were supposed to be uh, in here doing the Easter message, but they didn't get the message to the, to the welcome committee, and so the youth left and, and went in the back. And Elder Joe said, I'm sorry. I said, sorry about what? 
He said, well, I I didn't convey the message. I said, you know why? Because God didn't want them in here. He wanted them back there because they showed a video about the resurrection of Christ and the elder Joe gave an invitation and and one of those youths came up and gave their lives to Christ. God is in control. All we need to do is continue to follow his pattern and, 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 and look, stop judging people. My wife had to call me on the carpet the other day because I was, I was, I was, I, I got in my flesh. And my wife said, no, nah, wait a minute now. And I said, you're right. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm preaching to myself today. And I'm going to go back and listen to myself preach to me again. (laughs) (laughs) Sam, come on up here and play a song for me, man, while we get this taken care of. Joe came into the room. He was frantic in my office. He said, Pastor, the water in the, in the baptistry is cold. I said, and she wants to get in there anyway? He says, yeah. I said, no, I don't want to put it in no cold water. I said, look, can we start that thing and have him heat it up? And he says, I don't know if it'll be ready. I said, how long does it take? He said, about 30, 30, 45 minutes maybe. Water's warm. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I didn't, want you, I didn't want your experience to be in the baptistry frozen and think, ah, frozen in this thing. Thank you for coming forward. And uh, you had already given your life to Christ. This is something that God laid on your heart to do. And uh, you decided to follow the Lord's leading. And I'm so proud of you. 
The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Have you confessed him to be your Lord? Yes. Okay, would well, you sit down right there? There you go. Okay. Okay. Now imagine how it would be if it was cold. <laughs> this is this here is this is a hot tub kind of stuff here. All right. Hold your breath for me. In the name of Jesus. You all right? to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Lord bless our fellowship and our food together in Jesus name hallelujah amen have a great day love you thank you